Always feel free whenever you are within the precincts of this uh, organization. Indeed, calling RCMLD a continental geo home is in accord with the vision of its founders who almost 50 years ago envisioned a center that would champion the application of geospatial information and technologies in not only addressing pressing national issues but also spur development across the continent. So we hope we are living to that ideal and the presence of our governing council members here is testimony to that. It is in line with that vision that the center, together uh, with our esteemed partners, many of whom are here today, that the center has continued to provide services, tools, data, and information derived from Earth observations and allied IC technologies to support decision making in various areas uh, such as uh, agriculture and food security, weather and climate, water resources management, disaster management, land use and ecosystems, land information management, to mention just but a few. This we do through project implementation, and as I said, many of the partners we have here through their presentations and the exhibition that we have, you'll be able to learn some of the important transformative projects that we're implementing across uh, the African continent. We do capacity building uh, both to people already in their jobs, but as you have realized, we also have a growing institute at the center here that is offering cutting edge uh, training in our fields of surveying, cartography, photogrammetry, GIS, etc. The RCTI that has been growing over the past few years and now has a population of over 800 students undertaking different diploma and certificate courses. Uh, besides project implementation and capacity building, we also do work with you to undertake critical research uh, initiatives to answer some of the pressing problems on our continent and in our countries. And of course, from that, we offer advisory services. Very often when there are issues that require attention, we are called upon and we are happy that you join us in understanding the issues and providing advisory to member states and other stakeholders. Back to this conference, uh, which made its maiden appearance in 2017, it is also in line of exactly what I've said in terms of our services to member states, because it offers an opportunity for us as the center and the entire geo community to share what we do. You will see it through the different themes that we have over the past two days, through the exhibition we have uh, across this tent, that there are a number of things that you may not be uh, aware of, familiar with, that you have an opportunity to know the projects and activities that are underway. But also, when people come together, it will be an opportunity to exchange ideas on the latest methodologies and applications. Actually, this began yesterday, and I wish to thank Esri and uh, Digital Earth Africa, who, through a pre-conference event, were able to do some training and share some of the methodologies and uh, technologies that are available to the number of attendants that came from across our member states. So despite uh, the COVID-19 uh, setback, the conference has evidently uh, grown over the years attracting attention across the continent and beyond. And I over its short life, RIC uh, is becoming a premier conference within which many uh, presenters in our field are ready and interested in meeting uh, their counterparts. Of particular interest is the growth in interest from young people and women in particular uh, in our geo community. Uh, we've had a number of themes over the years uh, if you recall, uh, for those of you who have been able to attend the series of uh, conferences we've had, in 2017, our theme was Space Science Touches Lives. 
that was our maiden conference where we began by looking at what space science can be able to do to the person on the, uh, on the ground. In 2018, our theme was space science for sustainable development, broadening the scope to look more particularly what areas in our sustainable development endeavors uh, space science can impact. 2019, the theme was Earth Observations for Evidence-Based Decision Making. Obviously, we need to make a connection between what we do as geo people and our decision makers who really influence the direction our countries take. Uh, we didn't have one in 2020, but 2021, our theme was reflecting on resilience, mapping development challenges and solutions for a better world. And then we've moved on this year, and our theme is Earth Observation Services for Resilient Social Systems, where we will seek to explore the linkages between social systems and the potential as well as opportunities that Earth Observations offer uh, to really strengthening the social systems within our countries. So as individuals, organizations, uh, countries, and continents continue to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, rally the world uh, towards a shared blueprint uh, for peace and prosperity for people and planet, technology and no less your special technology offer is, a is, a, is very critical in is very crucial in building resilient social systems. And as I said, our own technology is very critical as we'll see from the presentations. So in the midst of many present day development challenges, uh, such as flooding, that I wish to share our sympathies with our, with our friends from Sudan who are experiencing floods, but we've experienced it in our, in our other uh, countries like Malawi. So these uh, natural disasters continue to afflict our countries we still have food security challenges, even in this country, in the same arid areas of this country and other parts of the Horn of Africa. We have water security challenges. We have pressing problems of urbanization. And in the midst of all that, we need to ask ourselves what we bring to the table as people who monitor and understand the earth on which all this is happening. And it is my sincere hope that through this conference, we can be able to share our knowledge and possibilities for mitigating them and the recovery where we have experienced such unfortunate incidences. So in conclusion, I hope uh, this conference inspires everybody towards our number one goal of finding solutions that will improve resilience of social systems and in some way contribute to sustainable development. So feel free to interact. This is the reason we are here today. I believe each one of us has an important element to bring to the table. Finally, but most importantly, even though I did it at the beginning, I wish to thank once again our governing council. And maybe if I'm allowed to indulge, I'll request the representative of Sudan, who is part of our governing council, and Andre from ECA, uh, to stand up for recognition as I conclude. Salah uh, from the Sudan and Andre, also member of the governing council. Please, you can just say hello to the people here. So for those of you who are not familiar with our governing structure, we are led by a governing council that includes uh, representatives from the 20 member states and ECA. And this is like our board, they give us direction in terms of what we do. On top, there's a conference of ministers that supervise their work to give us strategic direction. And all of them will be convening in Kampara in November to again see how we can take further the work of this institution. So their support and what we do is very important and I wish uh, that they are acknowledged in this uh, conference. Thank you for being with us. In the same vein, even though they'll have uh, time to speak, our partners uh, that uh, really work with us in all the programs that we do are cherished and 
they'll introduce themselves, but for those that are here, uh, I'll just mention the names, but I'll also re uh, re request those who are here to uh, wave. So some of our key partners are USID, NASA, EU, AU, I've mentioned ESRI, uh, from ESRI. Uh, we have Digital Earth Africa represented there. We have PASCO represented here. We have Kenya Airways and specifically Fahari Aviation represented here. Uh, we have FAO on the way. But we have other partners that will join online, including uh, C4. We have IUCN represented here. Uh, we will have uh, AU joining online as well. But the broader partnership includes other people such as UNDP, UNIDO, AGRA, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So there's a whole host of people that are part of what we achieve as a center. So we are here as a secretariat, we are here as an executive, but the work we do here is a contribution by uh, several institutions. Uh, I can't leave the stage without thanking our host government, uh, the Republic of the Government of Republic of Kenya, who have hosted this institution uh, since its inception. They provide us the, the environment to function and support us in every activity. And it's for that reason that we'll be having the guest honor of honor representing the government uh, delivering and opening this conference. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. And once again, feel at home. You are geo people. This is a geo home, so you are at home. Thank you very much. I want to both acknowledge and, and welcome uh, the executive team uh, for this incredible set of organizations that are collaborating to make a difference in advancing remote sensing and GIS technologies for positive benefit across the continent. IUCM, R RCMRD, the ECA, uh, Sudan, uh, Digital Earth Africa, Kenya Airways, C4, UNDP, and, and so many others. Um, it's an honor to, to represent ESRI at this event. Um, we have quite a diverse team that's, that's joining you for, this, uh, for this, these few days, and I really want to encourage you to um, visit with us in, in the booth that we have um, prepared and to engage with us on any topics of interest. Um, our team is joining you here from uh, our regional office here in Nairobi um, that serves not only Kenya, but many, many countries across East Africa, our Mideast and, and Africa team based in Dubai. Uh, my colleague, who's an expert in disaster response and, and recovery from Geneva, and uh, my colleague and I coming, coming to you from California in the United States. I was so grateful for the Director General's comments on the focus on resiliency and the incredible challenge that we're all facing uh, in this changing world. Uh, the director mentioned challenges of drought and flood. Um, where I come from in the United States, we have incredible challenges around fires. Um, and as we know, our climate is changing very rapidly and very radically. And frankly, no community is, is spared. These are global challenges. So as we face these global challenges, how can we prepare? How can we work towards this concept of resiliency? How can we find a sustainable future? And as you have all in your own paths come to this concept of remote sensing, of GIS, of geography-based systems, um, I would suggest that this is a critical technology. This is a fundamental technology for the future of humanity, for the well-being of biodiversity on this planet, for the systems that sustain all of us. So we're all here to learn. It's incredibly important um, for all of us in this field that we are constantly learning. I would say that's because of the nature of these challenges and our obligation as GIS, as remote sensing, as geographers, in some manner or other, taking those concepts of geography and technology, bringing those together, that we all have a bit of an obligation. We have a responsibility to advance our skills, to be the most capable and effective as we can. And that makes events like this extremely important. Everyone here has something to offer. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from one another. Um, we're here humbly and, and with 
great gratitude to have the opportunity to meet you, to collaborate with you, to get to know as many of you as possible, and to learn from you as well. So I want to, again, thank the executive team. There's many distinguished organizations here that are making major commitments to advance your work uh, for these goals of a, of a better future and a more resilient future. So it's an honor. Thank you all very much. Yeah. So next we have uh, Kenya Airways. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, it's our first time participating in the conference as Kenya Airways, and in particular as Fahari Aviation. So I know most of us are not aware of uh, Fahari Aviation. I'll give a brief introduction of the company. But before that, I'd like to recognize the Director General, RCMRD. Dr. Emmanuel Nkunzinza, representative from government, from the government of Kenya in particular, representative from the governing council, representatives from fellow partners and stakeholders, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. As I said earlier, I'm here to represent two organizations. The first one I think is well known to most of us, which is Kenya Airways PLC. And I've visited here a number of times with the Director General, and I realized that RCMLD has a tagline that says, Mapping for Sustainable Development. And that rhymes very well with us from Kenya Airways, because our mission is to contribute to the sustainable development of Africa. We have been in this business for a long time, ever since the East African Airways days and to the formation of Kenya Airways in 1977. So Kenya Airways as a corporate entity has been contributed to the sustainable development of Africa for over 45 years now. We actually celebrated our 45th year in February this year. And we have gone through a very difficult moment as Kenya Airways. Uh, we're in the business of air services, air transportation services. And two years ago, I know we are all aware, especially air services for passenger transport collapsed. And at Kenya Airways, what we decided to do is to look into other ways that relates to our core business and look for the ways to contribute or to continue our, our contribution to the sustainable development of Africa, to stick to our mission. And that's where Fire Aviation comes in. Comes in. So Fire Aviation is a wholly owned subsidiary of Kenya Airways PLC. Our mandate is in application of technology emerging aviation technologies, advanced aviation technologies that will contribute to transforming African communities. So our mission is transforming African communities through sustainable technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you now see where our vision with RCMRD gets points of convergence. At Fahari Aviation, we offer services in aerial mapping, in photogrammetry, in GIS, in cartography, but mostly through use of technology. So what we do is we have the emerging technology of drones that fortunately for us in Kenya here has received approval in terms of use uh, regulations for use of civilian drones. So at Fahari Aviation, a company that was formed actually in 2020 at the height of the pandemic, we took drone technology as our first technology of implementation. 
And now we have services in surveillance, we have services in inspections, we have services in agriculture, conservation, and all aspects that RCTI offers in terms of training. It is our endeavor, as the DG has mentioned, to continue the partnership with RCMRD towards embedding drone technology in all aspects of the regional center. I will also invite and indulge you to our booth. If you find time, we have a team from Fari Aviation that will show you what we do, I'll show you a snapshot of the projects that we've taken uh, in Kenya. Our aim this year and beginning of next year is to go regional. We still have a small challenge. I was discussing with my colleague from Sudan. We still have a small challenge from a regulatory aspect. Our neighbors have not yet enacted regulations for civilian use of drones, but we see through our East African liaison a path towards enactment of regulations for use of drone across the region. Last but not least, I thank the DG and the regional center for seeing it fit that Fari Aviation through Kenya we should participate in this conference and we are looking forward to engagement with all the partners here and future clients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, tomorrow, just before the lunch break, uh, Fari Aviation Kenya Airways will be demonstrating uh, use of drone technology just out here. Please find time to uh, attend the showcasing. Next, oh, we have uh, the representative from FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, Kenya. Uh, Amos, please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Master of Ceremony, Director General, uh, government representatives, our development partners, all protocols of subs, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Hamisi Williams is my name. I work with FAO as the assistant country representative and the head of programs for the country. And uh, this morning, I'm here to represent our country representative, Madam Carla Mukavi. Um, receive her apologies. Uh, we relate very closely with the institution here and it was important that we are represented. Uh, we are a good partner and you are a good partner as well. We value that a lot. Uh, but because of other engagement she was not able. And then um, I will therefore just uh, address this gathering by giving a little bit of uh, what she wrote but then i'll put in one or two words which she didn't write those will be mine so that uh, we are comprehensively uh, represented here so as fao we are a specialized agency of the united nations that leads the international efforts to defeat hunger our work is guided by a strategic framework that is prepared and developed in the context of the major global, regional, national, and if you want, county challenges in the areas that our mandate uh, requires that we operate. Uh, presently, we are under the banner of what we call the strategic framework 2022-2031 uh, that looks into taking the world into a more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems for what we call the four betters. That is the better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life, leaving no one behind, of course. So if you 
get those betas, just like the speaker before me, you find uh, the nexus through which we are a very valuable, we consider ourselves a very valuable partner to this particular institution, and we want to continue in that uh, trajectory. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, digital technologies such as geospatial and earth observation technologies are key drivers of sustainable development and economic growth in developing countries such as Kenya. These technologies cut across decision-making support, land and soil suitability and capability analysis, resource allocation, land use planning, revenue collection, and early warning system for mitigation of disasters and risks, identifying and monitoring natural resource use and propose adequate information for policy related solutions. Now, that statement is a little loaded, but in a nutshell, with proper data collection, analysis, proper technology, like the one that is being promoted on uh, the uh, geospatial and earth uh, observations, you are able to make the right decisions about a number of things. But most importantly for us that are in the food and nutrition uh, security sector, you will be able to make decisions that are going to go a long way in supporting to address the issues of food and nutrition security. Sometimes in the developing world, mostly, we make decisions that probably are not uh, backed by data. They are not backed by you know, the precision that you require. What happens at the end of the day? Sometimes you throw resources into wrong places just because you didn't have the right information. And therefore, technologies like this would be good because they will help in the decision making and therefore will be so targeted uh, when we do our um, uh, business of food and nutrition uh, security uh, support. Now, sustainable development and economic growth in developing countries therefore require the use of technologies. Those will be the key drivers. They will also be I mean, catalyst for change. And FAO has been a key supporter of adoption of that type of technology, or these technologies at global, country, and also at the county level. Actually, from some of the conversations we've had here, we also had, had very interesting conversations, DG, uh, with the Airbus, um, where in Vihiga, we had started some uh, uh, very interesting uh, projects that are looking at precision agriculture. And that is the way to go, because this really is going to inform uh, your targeting of resource allocation and also eventually improve on your production. Therefore, we consider ourselves uh, very lucky to always be part of the RIC. And for this year, being part of RIC 2022, and also being part of the fraternity of this team that is having this conversation. It is just what we consider as the right conversation to have, really at the right time. Because again, when we talk of the app technologies, the GIS, we uh, would be interested on those technologies that will help us to unlock the potential of land being a major factor of production. Institution here, for the last five years, thanks to EU and our good collaboration with them, we actually implemented what we are calling the Land Governance Program. The land governance program was first piloted in two counties in this country. Later, it went to nine country, uh, counties. In those counties, we have been able to, do, uh, to train over 200 county technical officials in advanced geospatial technology 
and also we supported the establishment of nine GIS laboratories in those counties. And these have, been, uh, have become so handy uh, on the mapping and actually also uh, leading to titling of the community lands. Um, if you go to Vega, I have to mention that, you'll find again how that particular lab has been used beyond what we intended it to do. And now it's on the other things I mentioned earlier, including revenue collection. This way, you use technology uh, comprehensively and in a holistic manner, uh, then you are able to support more with actually less. And that's one other thing or one other beauty of technology. Uh, because of the success of that land governance program at that uh, level, special technology and also other kind of support that would eventually also lead to security of tenure. We're doing this while we are so much aware that those particular activities will help to unlock the potential of land as a factor of production. We're so much aware also alive to the fact that technology will come in handy in everything else that we are going to do in that process. And if you've seen, and I must congratulate government on this, the ministry has done quite a lot uh, in the last few years trying to digitize that particular uh, subsector uh, of our important, uh, I mean, important subsector of our economy, uh, including the National Land Information Management System. We worked together with the ministry there and we're grateful for what uh, came out of that particular program. On the other hand, again, we are working closely with the Ministry of Agriculture and also the other sector ministries and departments to implement what we are calling the Kenya Integrated Agriculture Information Management System. We call that KIAMIS. Actually, KIAMIS now, in the next few years, we're going to work to have them meet together with the National Land Information Management System. So that on one side, we're using technology to register land, and then you ask the question, it's land for what? But when you want to now get it for production, for any other thing that you want to do, you will come to the other side of the government, and you find the Agriculture Information Management System there. Now, the going even further and talking of land commercialization initiative. So all that is technology driven and that's why this particular conversation is very, very critical to us and therefore we want to commit that we will continue in this partnership with RCMRD and all the other partners that have been working together with us and uh, the new partners that are also coming into the conversation, like I just heard Kenya Airways. I think we can fly land very well and very safely and make it the pride of Kenya as well and the pride of our counties, if we lock the potential. Thank you so much for listening to me. God bless you. On behalf of Digital Earth Africa, um, to indicate as well that uh, moving forward, uh, we do appreciate the partnership and um, our model is is premised on our delivery model of on partner on collaborating with with implementing partners. Digital at Africa was made possible by Australian innovation using uh, the Open Data Cube that is internationally recognised as a game changer for the use of satellite information to address sustainable development challenges. I stand here today and proud to say now Digital Earth Africa, um, depending on your orientation, I usually say by Africa for Africa, and I know uh, the team will say for Africa by Africa. Digital Earth Africa is now led in Africa with a team um, in Africa. We offer an operational data infrastructure making current and, hist and historical analysis ready satellite data freely available and openly accessible for the entire continent. So as I stand here today and elevate the role of Earth observation and the power of translating satellite images into useful decision making ready information, 
um, one cannot overemphasize that um, our challenges as the continent are similar regardless of where in Africa you are placed. We talk of sustainable development goals. Uh, food security is, is number one challenge um, across all the, all the countries in the continent. From sustainably uh, managing the environment and mitigating climate change to developing resources and, under, and unleashing agricultural potential, Africa must overcome a number of challenges to meet the needs of its fast growing population. And of course, as I said, gentle, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is also in response to the sustainable development goals. At observation, or by enabling or using earth ob observation, we believe that we have the capacity or the ability to also directly contribute towards the African Union Agenda 2063 framework. Now, on the economic front, um, and I usually capitalize this on potential, uh, because at times we talk billions, and the question will be, where are these billions? Are we not seeing them? Earth Africa relies on the power of collaboration, which we, we dearly appreciate with RCMRT. And this power of collaboration will ensure that we continue to strengthen our capacity building. Um, we make the difference in the lo respective local and regional areas as well. In fact, such collaborations offer opportunities for countries across the continent to engage and leverage the power that we have you know, with our natural resources as Africa, as the continent. And to date, RCMRD remains a very active and engaged implementing partner. And our commitment to a long-held successful relationship is one that we look forward to nurturing for many years to come. Thank you for welcoming us, DG, Dr. Nkurunziza. And we, we are on behalf of Digital Earth Africa, we are looking forward to the next three days. Uh, we're looking forward to engagements, to learnings, and most importantly, capitalizing on the power of collaborations. Um, in my language, um, I will say, Niabonga Gakulu Asante Sana. Representative from governments, representative from development partners, representative from international organizations, esteemed participants. It gives me great pleasure uh, to stand before you uh, to give a few remarks from IUCN on behalf of my director, uh, Luther Anukur, who couldn't join uh, us today. Uh, but this is sort of a symbol of our long-standing commitment to the partnership that we have with IUCN, uh, with RCMRD, and other related uh, partners in this uh, meeting today. Uh, so just briefly, IUCN is um, one of the largest uh, conservation organizations in the world. Uh, the uh, key milestones that uh, we've been able to accomplish together uh, through our collaboration with RCM, RCMRD. So through an initiative of uh, the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States, funded by the 11 EDF of the European Union, IUCN and the Joint Research Center of um, the re, sorry of the European Union partnering with RCMRD in the development and promotion of promotion of regional resource hub. So the regional resource hub acts as one of the regional observatories implemented by the Biodiversity and Protected Area Management Program, Biopama, uh, which you'll see there, and is hosted by the regional center for mapping of resources. Uh, for development. So we have a unit that we've been gracefully allocated by the DG uh, to run this important facility. Please do take time uh, to visit them at the booth and find out more. Uh, other similar hubs have been established uh, with Biopharma support in West and Central Africa as well as in the Caribbean and Pacific. Uh, the uh, Regional Resource Hub is a knowledge hub that compiles and analyzes relevant data and provides information to support field intervention and policy dialogues for fair, effective management and governance of protected areas in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, the Regional Resource Hub also supports regional economic communities 
to fast track regional policy targets and agreements and support their implementation. For example, the SADAC Transfrontier Conservation Area portal is fully incorporated in the regional resource rehab and some content management responsibility have been taken over by this hub. Um, in addition, we're working with the IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development Secretariat, providing technical support in compiling and collecting available biodiversity-related data and identifying data that exist. At ESC, that the East African community, uh, we are finalizing the Regional Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, which the resource, Regional Resource Hub will be inputting. So, um, complementary to this is uh, work that we are doing uh, with governments, uh, with the civil society, uh, on the forest and landscape restoration agenda, AFR 100, as you know, governments have committed to these ambitious targets of restoring 100 million hectares of degraded forest across the continent by the year 2030. So it's a 30 by 30 agenda, and data spatial mapping is core to it. We have other uh, unique ambitions that we are driving uh, with the AU under the Great Green Wall of the Sahel. We are also currently initiating the Great Green Wall of uh, Southern Africa with SADAC, as well as the Great Blue Wall of Indian Ocean, which we'll be inviting a couple of you in the room uh, to participate and see how spatial data can provide real-term policy and action solutions uh, to enhance our planet's sustainability. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to encourage you to find out uh, more about our work on the Regional Resource Hub, as I say. Visit them at the exhibition space, engage with the team, and discuss how you and your country can contribute and benefit from mapping analysis that are carried out by this team. So I'd like just to end on a personal note by thanking the DG. Uh, 20 years ago, I used to work at uh, USA. It used to be at Kasarani here. This used to be a very small complex. Uh, but seeing this monumental growth is really a fantastic testimony of the important work that you do and the trust and belief and expectation that all these stakeholders have vested on you and uh, you are very uh, dynamic council. So to wish you well in this conference and look forward to productive interaction. Thank you all. Thank you so, so much. Um, we'll move right away to... Uh, you will see on the program that some persons are going to present online, so I want to exhaust the ones that are physical here. So let me have uh, Andre from UNECA, uh, then we shall have someone from PASCO, and then we move to the online presentation. Thank you. We we'll keep it within five minutes, sir. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm telling my boss to keep it five minutes. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Good morning, each and everyone. Uh, His Excellency, uh, the representative of the government of the Republic, Republic of Kenya. Um, His Excellency, the chairperson of the RCMRG Governing Council. Um, esteemed representative from international organizations and uh, United Nations agencies, uh, G.R. Emmanuel, director of the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, distinguished guests and participants, good morning again. I am very happy to be here today for this uh, fifth session of the RCMRD International Conference. And I wish to convey the greeting um, of the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for, for Africa. Um, the theme of this year's uh, conference reflecting on resilient social systems is very important. Has Africa uh, accelerated its economic and digital transformation? So, Today, I'm here to say that uh, we are witnessing uh, that African government and other sector of society have become more increasingly aware of the importance of earth observation, geospatial science and technology as a tool to facilitate special data collection, uh, access, analysis and use in the decision-making processes, both nationally, as we have here this morning, and also regionally. 
I'm also here to say that um, we are seeing an emergence of uh, a community of robust space and geospatial experts. And um, the technology is increasingly becoming the driving force of many applications and services from land administration uh, to natural resource management to agriculture to security to humanitarian and other social challenges. I'm also here to say that, uh, unfortunately, despite uh, gains made, spatial information is not yet leveraged to its full potential in the, in the continent. And Africa, as compared to other regions uh, of the world, uh, with few notable exceptions, is still lagging behind. Why? I want us to take the opportunity of uh, this uh, important conference and openly ask ourselves and discuss on what do we see as the main gap and challenge for the uptake of air force technology by African country and what deserve uh, priority attention. What are, from our perspective, some of the key elements about the importance of air force aviation technology for announcing policy decision by African nation for purpose in management of our lands, place and, and, and prosperity we want. What type of quick win do we see to stimulate the usage of geospatial science and technology, air force aviation for our society and uh, for the management of his uh, resources. What? Why geospatial science and technology is not well introduced into the working environment of uh, African country? Is there any data issues? Any capaci capacity issues? What? I have no doubt uh, that RCMRG and its related initiatives and program, such as uh, this conference, can help us respond to these queries. As we have seen from previous speaker that uh, for the last 50 years, ACMSD is contributing to heighten national special information frameworks and structure for delivering uh, inclusive and holistic information for our society and empowering our community to do as much as possible by, by themselves. This is, by, by the way, this is also the geospatial vision of the Economic Commission for, for Africa. At ECA, we have started uh, building with member state and with the support of the United Nations Global Geospatial Information Management, what we call Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. This new paradigm has the assumption that, yes, we can ha advance holistic policy and strategy through a coordinated approach of cooperative management of geospatial information. Yes, again, we can build purpose-oriented data set, structured and comprehensive data foundation that will be consistent, comparable and compatible at the local, national and regional level. Yes, one more. We can foster the integration of all development inf information, including statistical, geospatial information, big data, administrative data, making them what I would say could fair to critically participate and contribute to an information and a resilient so society. I would like to take the opportunity to salute and commend the leading role of uh, RCMRG with its continued engagement with, uh, in programs such as GMS in Africa, Digital Earth Africa, Servir Africa, and so many. I hope we can draw from the ex various experience today uh, some of the best practices that can assure that we, we deliver in a more joined up approach 
in providing geospatial information to to our government and citizen. So at the end of the day, we need to keep being engaged and committed. That's why I want to reiterate again that uh, the ECA uh, will continue to provide the needed assistance to our member state to develop their capability in establishing cooperative uh, production management use of geospatial information resources for today and more importantly uh, for the post-crisis recovery effort. Our landscape, landscape is changing rapidly. That's why we have started reflecting on how we can modernize the National Mapping Agency uh, so that they can keep upgrading their geospatial uh, strategy and operation in order to remain effective and efficient so that they can become more agile in responding to our uh, society uh, present needs. I do expect that the conference will, will provide oversight and advisory input for future niche where activity will expand, uh, will be significantly expanded to cover the fostering of innovation, product, and service development. Please tell us where we should give more emphasis to develop services that will drive Africa to become more specially enabled. I'm happy to see so many young geospecialists, uh, if I can say like that, so many young people embracing uh, the geospatial and the health conservation domain field. This is where the future is. And I would like to, to say that we will continue to, to, to put a, a lot of emphasis on, on how we get more young people uh, participating in, in, in this. I'm concluding here in congratulating uh, RCMRT and the uh, various partners for sizing this conference and also the so many passionate people in this place today, all the speakers and the support staff. Thank you for your initiative to hold this event that is critical to our common, common future. My sincere gratitude for the opportunity of presenting this remark. But before I conclude, let me say just in 30 second uh, uh, program director that the Economic Commission for Africa is one of the three Pan-African institutions along with the African Development Bank and the African Union Commission. We are the regional arm of the United Nations in the, in the African continent. And we are, have been supporting the development of mapping, cartography, national spatial data infrastructure, integrated geospatial frameworks in the continent for the last 50 years. And let me also say, for those who don't know, that the RCMRT has been created under the auspice of the ECA in the 1975. And the shield has grown and has even become more bigger than the, than the father. And as a father, we are very proud of that. We are proud of seeing how uh, uh, the representative of USAID has said it in the right manner, has Archimedes has grown to become some things that we all today must be proud of. So let me take the opportunity and ask all of you to give a round of applause to the staff of RCMRD, those who have been here in the past and laid the foundations and I would like to acknowledge and recognize the former director of RCMRG, Dr. Farah Hussein, the current staff of uh, RCMRG with uh, the uh, ongoing director, Dr. Emmanuel Kurunziza, and also uh, we should recognize those who will be coming in the future. You all young people who are at the, at the gate to come in. So give ourselves a round of applause. We should be proud today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. Uh, and thank you for organizing the past, present, and future of RSM already. Thank you so much. Um, let's have Pasco, uh, presented from Pasco. Then we please come. Five minutes or less. Please, thank you. 
near master of ceremony and director general and the distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen good morning and uh, yeah it's my great great pleasure to attend this event of CMRD RIC 2022 yeah it is very uh, momental opportunity to uh, break through the COVID-19 so a uh, few people uh, should wear the mask. However, yeah, we will proceed to the future. So I'd like to uh, introduce a bit about the history of PASCO uh, because uh, we, uh, next year, we will have 70 years old. So since 1953, we founded as an aerial photogrammetry uh, company. And uh, maybe probably 1980s, we come here uh, for the uh, JICA project, uh, Kenya Survey Authority as Assistance Project, and uh, we bring the, our experience uh, technology to uh, share with the Kenya Survey Authority at that time. And after the 21st century, uh, we come here through the various kind of JICA project. We do it all over the uh, African countries. Uh, with some, such kind of forestry project and surveying project, and we have various experience. And we have shared the geospatial uh, technology and data processing te technology. And uh, recent decade, so uh, we proceeded to more uh, another uh, industry area, that is the satellite data technology. Yes. So why I come here is uh, to share, uh, to introduce the uh, satellite, a uh, Japanese satellite uh, newly launched, uh, will be launched the next uh, six months, within six months, uh, was, uh, the name is L3. And now, nowadays, uh, AI technology is uh, very available for the geospatial area, industry area. So we have uh, facilitate and uh, very effective way to process the Japanese uh, various kind of project to apply with AI technology. So, but however, what is AI technology? Is that the running or the machine learning? No, there are various uh, prospects of the AI. So, but however, you, the user and the site people, site engineer should know the AI, what is the AI technology, uh, what is the tips of how to use it, how to use more effective way to apply with the uh, actual phenomena on the site. So uh, maybe on the booth, uh, if you uh, stop at our Pascode booth, I'd like to share and introduce the Pascode experience in Japan. So now uh, L3 will be launched six months later. So it would be available for the, uh, every uh, everybody in the world, every user in the world. But however, it should be processed with more effective way to, uh, to apply it with AI technology or of course GIS or remote sensing technology as well. However, what I want to share with you is, uh, I mean, yeah, Esri is a company of the science of wear. <laughs> Pasco is a manufacturer of wear <laughs> or something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what I would like to say is uh, yeah, how to use it is uh, a kind of the, uh, information to be shared with all of you. Yeah, please uh, come to our booth. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the honor uh, to invite our guest of honor. Uh, we, our guest owner is representing the government of the Republic of Kenya. And maybe let me also take this opportunity to thank many of you who took the courage to be able to travel here. I think initially, as Paul indicated, because of uh, the political situation that was going on, we are not sure whether uh, we would be able to proceed. And many of our political leaders could not be able to be with us today. But we 
when we operate with the government Kenya, we work with the department DRSRS and the Department of Service and Mapping. So we are happy today to have representative of DRSRS opening our conference on behalf of the public of Kenya. Uh, Mr. David Kiyama, we are privileged to have you here. Please welcome and address this gathering and open our conference. Thank you. Director General of Regional Center for Mapping, Dr. Emmanuel Nikurunzinsa. Participants drawn from various institutions at industry. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my esteemed pleasure to start before this congregation of geospatial and survey technologists who are congregating here today to witness one of the most important calendar events of the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, the RIC 2022, whose theme is Earth Observation Services for Resilient Social Systems. I stand here to represent my director, Dr. Moses Akali, who had wished to be with us today. However, due to engagement with other official matters, the director has sincerely conveyed his apologies and promised to join us during the closing ceremony. It is in this regard that the director requested me to represent and deliver his speech as follows. The representative of the Regional Center for Mapping Governing Council, Director General Regional Center for Mapping, par partners present here today, representatives from various member states, representatives of various academic and research institutions, the entire community of the Regional Center for Mapping, of Resources for Development, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great moment for me and everyone here that we are able to meet again for RIC in 2022. This has not been possible since 2019 because of the COVID-19 pandemic. My appreciation goes out to different partners and institutions in government, private sector and academia that have in one way or another supported this conference and those that have sent in representatives to attend the conference. For the benefit of the gather gathering and our different stakeholders, I wish to place myself in this great regional center for mapping community. As, a, as has been mentioned by the DG, the regional center is owned by 20 member states and in, and in each member state, the line ministry or department is the ministry responsible for mapping and geospatial services. In Kenya, the line institutions include the Ministry of Labs and Physical Planning and the Directorate of Resource Service and Remote Sensing. Office of the President. It is in this capacity as the Director of DRSRS that I'm here to address you on behalf of the Government of Kenya. My remarks will focus on three key words in this year's theme, that is services, resilience, and social systems. Starting with the social aspects, the conference look at social issues at individual, family, community, and societal levels. We are all aware of the dehumanizing effects of the devastating flooding in Pakistan, drought in the Horn of Africa, and tornadoes in the USA. To achieve resilience against such vulnerabilities, it's important that our planning and decision-making processes adopt 
evidence-based planning. A key question, therefore, is how can Earth observation and geospatial technology support planning and implementation of robust and resilient social systems? On services, we are living in an information explosion age where data and information sharing is much more open thanks to the internet and the whole array of technologies collecting data about our planet. But to be useful, data must be translated into information that helps to solve problems. Therefore, I do hope that RIC 2022 will also provide a platform for innovative ways to translate data from satellites and other sources to products that solve societal challenges and problems. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's strive to build our capacity, commit to social action, and foster strategic partnerships and, info and innovation to address the societal challenges we are facing. I now declare RIC 2022 officially open. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, guest of honor. Uh, we appreciate. Uh, next, we move to the keynote address session. Uh, my sister, my compatriot from the Republic of Uganda, Dr. Jen Demigisa, will be the moderator. Thank you, Jen. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Chair of the conference. Um, I'm so glad to be here now to usher in now a new step to the conference, which is now going to be uh, looking at the, um, uh, the how question. Uh, we are now going to the how question of the Earth Observation's utility to our social uh, systems. And uh, on hand, we are going to have two presenters. And the first one will present on social challenges at a global glance. And also, uh, we'll have the second uh, keynote presenter uh, uh, looking at the Earth Observation uh, um, uh, information in environment and development. And not to go um, uh, further in my own talk, I'd like to give the opportunity to uh, our first keynote speech uh, 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 opportunity, uh, we, we Mr. Chiheno. Sorry, we shall have it the other way around. Let's have the second one, who is physical, then the first one will be online. Ah, all right, that's Thank okay. You. All right, then we will have the first one as the Earth Observation Information in Environment and Development, and this is going to be delivered by uh, David. David Gidson, Gisben, Director of Conservation uh, um, Solutions at Ezri Global. He has a uh, wealth of experience of 20 years uh, in geoinformation applications uh, at natural resources management and to conservation specifically. We are so glad and uh, have the pleasure to invite you, David. See if we could just maybe back up a slide. I'm not sure where the presentation is loaded. Is that in the back here? The, okay, great. Yeah, if we could just go back to the very first slide, that would be terrific. Well, thank you all. Again, I'm David Gadsden. I had a moment to, to greet you all earlier. Um, it's, it's a terrific honor for me to be here. Um, as I mentioned, we have quite a substantial team. I realize that I'm the last presentation before, uh, second to last presentation before the break. So while I've prepared some remarks, I will sort of quickly go through them. Um, you've all had the opportunity to um, hear a bit about Esri in the past, and so I, I won't, I won't uh, spend too much time. Um, 
Would it be possible to have the presentation on the screen for the for the audience to see? Ah, oh, Santi. Okay. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you again for, for having me. Let me just get comfortable with the device here. So for those of you not familiar, Esri is a very unique organization. We were founded in 1969 uh, by Jack and Laura Dangerman. Uh, Jack, like many of you, had studied uh, geospatial technology in the very early days where they were really beginning to determine how to take the real world and abstract that into a computing environment. It turns out it's very complicated. The world is not round. It's a very funny shape to accurately come up with coordinate systems and do measurements and create layers of information to overlay was not trivial. So in the late 1960s, as computers began to stabilize and not be the size of this room, but smaller rooms and then these sort of uh, computing systems that were accessible uh, in the universities, uh, Jack was there with some of the original uh, thinkers that were creating what became geographic information systems. He then returned home to Redlands, California, where I'm living now, um, and they founded Esri there. Um, Jack and Laura, uh, they took a small loan from Laura's parents, about $3,000 US, um, and they started this company building these geospatial tools. And they never again took on more debt. They just worked for small uh, organizations, developing systems, providing geographic-based tools for land use management, forestry management, uh, parcels and, and private, private property management. And Esri has gradually grown now for over 52 years. Um, we're still reporting and, and managed by Jack and Laura Dangerman. We're not on the stock market. We're not reporting to other shareholders. Uh, we serve the users of our technology. That's the entire structure of our organization. And that's very unique in information technology. Um, we're not a Facebook. We're not a Microsoft. We're not a massive organization. We're actually very focused on just geospatial tools and just serving the users of the, those tools. So it's an honor for, for us to, to work uh, for Esri. So generally, if we could stay on the slides uh, on the screen behind me, that, that would be great. I'd like to just quickly speak to, to some of these. Geospatial technology is advancing rapidly around the world. Um, now, you all know the relevancy in your project areas or in your focus areas for the tools. What's changing is GIS is truly becoming societal, meaning when the COVID-19 outbreak took place, these tools that had been perhaps designed for land-based challenges, natural resources and, and other, other, other uses, have been growing for many years in the field of global health. Um, they were essential, for example, in eradicating polio in Africa and Nigeria um, because of the critical importance of knowing where the children were that needed to be vaccinated relative to where the vaccination teams were going in this repeated activity to produce vaccinations. So when COVID occurred, um, dashboards were created to take all of the global incidence data and to summarize the development sense uh, in the human footprint around the world. And it's frankly at a place where we have many, many challenges. Um, the human footprint around the world is placing pressure on all of the natural systems that are there sustaining us, the clean air, the clean water, right? Access to clean water. Um, I focus on biodiversity at Esri and our, our work in conservation. There has been a massive decline in global biodiversity over the, over the last 50 years. That's the result of how humans are leveraging the Earth's resources. But the challenge is how can we do better? And in order to do better, we must have better understanding. How do we achieve that understanding? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my belief is that the technologies which you've chosen to focus on in your careers and the executives here are investing in to help empower uh, local, national, regional, and global organizations to leverage are essential because all of these challenges are taking place in space. They are geographic challenges. They're not happening in one place. They're actually happening everywhere and they're overlaying one another. They're compounding upon one another. And so we need a technology framework that allows us to make sense of these challenges. 
the geospatial tools give us that opportunity to take a geographic approach to problem solving. So geography, space, the connectivity and relationships and influence in space, the fundamentals of geography that are much older than any of the technology we're here to talk about, simply the, the benefit of thinking geographically when coupled with this technology becomes very powerful. Right? And that's why your expertise is so important as a translator, as an ambassador, as an implied, as an applied user, as an, I would say, as an applied geographer. So you're taking these tools that are not well understood by everyone and you're helping bring the right tool to the right challenge through a geographic approach. And mapping is obviously fundamental to all of this, but this is much more than mapping. Right, because we're talking about integrated systems, potentially live and real time systems, where you're not just working with a shape file that might be a few years old. You're potentially working with satellite imagery that might be constantly refreshed, or sensors on, on items that are moving. One of my, our colleagues here from, from the MAP scientific team in South Africa has developed a very elegant IoT or an Internet of Things integration with Esri tools so that animal collars or various sensors such as the level of water in a water tank becomes integrated into the system and is there in a dashboard for decision making. So systems today are, mapping remains extremely important. In fact, mapping is sort of a framework that allows us to bring in many different types of information, whether it's social, whether it's environmental, whether it's the changing dynamics of the, of the natural world. But these sensors coming in take us to an entirely new level of systems that are constant. They're, they're, they're prevalent. They're always there for us to check in on. As opposed to much of our experience in, in geography and GIS has been, we're going to work with some data sets. We're going to make, make sense of them through some cartography. And we're going to produce a, produce a map. And then, and then we're done. And maybe we do that over again in six months or a year. Right? The systems today, as I'm describing, are constantly integrated and effectively live. So a dashboard, which is a collection of different uh, data feeds into one nice visual product that shows us charts and graphs, as well as maps, might be constantly updated. It's different every single day. And those are the types of systems that you're all able to develop and bring forward to the challenges that we're now facing. We think of that concept, that sort of application of geography through GIS as a geographic approach to problem solving that I mentioned earlier. So it is very holistic. And because, again, the nature of these challenges are so multi-threaded and overlapping, we need a whole holistic approach to solving problems along these lines. You're familiar with GIS, and I want to encourage you to continue to stay on top of the evolution of this technology. It continues to grow and expand very rapidly. Um, I stepped through sort of that taking a shapefile, producing a map, and I, I don't want to disparage or say that that's not appropriate. What I am su suggesting is that this is actually a complete integrated pathway to solving problems. It's a pathway to gathering more understanding and sharing that understanding in an entirely new way by colleagues of yours in this, um, in this endeavor. So these are just a few examples of the role of GIS that's taking place today in environmental assessment and conservation, um, looking not only around, around ecosystems and planning, but the impact of noise around airports, the impact of major storms, natural resource management, not only trees and forestry, but agriculture, uh, looking at coffee production, um, mineral exploration, many others. So maybe if we could just keep the slides up, because I'm, I'm actually just going to show through. Thank you, thank you. Um, quickly going through, land information re remains so critical. Um, there was an, a, a terrific comment earlier uh, by, by, a, by a previous speaker on the importance of the, the benefit of geospatial benefit to tech, the benefit of geospatial technology to the continent. I would also say that benefit is also about the lack of conflict um, and the potential conflict that takes place when land is not well defined, 
when ownership is not well defined, the conflict that ensues. That's what you're able to avoid by implementing good land management systems and, and credible cadastro systems. And so there's credibility and knowledge about ownership across the landscape and land use. And there's, in my field of conservation, we have a long way to go. There have been many designated conservation areas that aren't well demarcated or their boundaries aren't well known. And so there is a constant pressure against those areas. We still have much work to do in this regard. Planning across regions for making uh, plans for sustainable growth, appropriate development areas, not putting large populations in watersheds that, or in floodplains that may lead to disaster scenarios down the road. Again, holistic thinking, integrated thinking. Um, today, GIS is not just about landscapes and, and broad geographic areas. You can bring these tools into buildings. So you're managing campuses, you're managing space, you're managing the efficiency of physical structures with these same geographic tools that allow you to make effective decisions. Uh, transportation, again, becomes increasingly important as cities continue to grow and, and the challenges of, of effective and low carbon alternatives for moving people from work back to home in, in and across these urban areas. Um, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, disasters are only increasing, unfortunately, right? We're in a stage where everything is dynamic, dynamically changing and some of these events are, are are devastating to, to many communities around the world. Planning for, trying to mitigate and prepare uh, for these events, and then recovering as efficiently as possible, as possible is also essential. I mentioned the, the COVID and the polio advance uh, examples earlier, but human health remains a major focus and oppor opportunity for these geospatial tools, as well as planning for economic development and where to place businesses, how to build markets, how to support customers effectively across landscapes. Imagery and remote sensing continues to advance dramatically. So not only is that content and, and, and information available for you to work with, but it's being made available through dynamic web services. So that rather than wanting a satellite image and waiting to download several gigabytes of imagery, you're able to store and manage that imagery in an, an online infrastructure and access it in a very light manner, even on a mobile device, even in the field. And that imagery is not just a picture of what's happening, it allows you to conduct analysis back on that server, but used on a very light mobile client. It's a, it's a major uh, evolution. Of course, there's so much happening with AI and analytics. Um, I have a colleague here that will be speaking this week on uh, remote sensing and agriculture. I want to encourage you to, to attend her session because there's really some amazing uh, evolution taking place in regard to remote sensing. Now, I would say that all of this work is leading us to a place where we have new opportunities for collaboration. And if the, if the end result of your work is a map that only a few people look at, then we might be missing an opportunity. Um, the opportunity today is that portals, which have been around for a very long time, to organize available geographic information and provide access uh, to the people interested in that information, they've now grown into this concept of a hub. And a hub is a collaborative framework where you can even sign in and become a member of that hub. You can access open data in many different formats. You can download apps and collect new information and contribute it to the hub. So we're building community around geospatial tools, around geographic tools, and hubs and the final point of engagement uh, is extremely important. Um, there are many examples that are increasingly touching our lives, right? Elections, um, global health issues, right? Where geographic information is being increasingly made available in a useful way. Um, you have the access to those tools to be able to take your project and your focus and make it accessible and engaging in that, in that way. GIS, as I mentioned, continues to evolve rapidly. Um, I would really encourage you to chat with my colleagues and I at the booth, attend our sessions. Uh, we'd love to hear about their work you're doing as well. We're very focused on advancing these tools at Esri. We're very excited to share with you everything that's available. And this brings us back to this concept of mapping common ground. 
Um, I, would, I would encourage all of you to think about your role, even though you might be focused on a specific program area. I want to thank you. It's been an honor uh, to be here today. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope you get a chance to spend some time with my colleagues and I, and uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you again. Thank you so much, David, for that uh, e excellent presentation. Uh, I would like to get to the next presenter, and um, uh, we have information that uh, Madame Chihenyo is not around, so we'll have Dr. Mugo, who is the chief of party Savile project uh, uh, at RCMRD. Uh, Mr. Mugo, uh, Dr. Mugo, we have worked together already at uh, um, different levels. And uh, we appreciate that it was now at country and at uh, ecosystem level. And of course, we are very privileged to hear from you. On behalf of um, uh, Madame, who has 15 years of experience and skills in natural resources management and also climate resilience uh, at all levels, I understand. So Dr. Mugo, the stage is yours. Good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Teddy, could you please help us to get the slides on board? Um, please go to the first slide. See that I am the one standing between you and T. I'll try to make it as short as possible. So um, I will also try to make sure that I can Next slide, please. I, yeah, I will keep saying that until I am able to uh, man the technology here. So I think a number of us have spoken previously about the various development challenges that we are going through, which I don't want to overly emphasize. Drought, uh, water insecurity, and conflicts in the region and they can be single-handedly looked at or even synergistically looked at. Next. So USAID is a development agency. They look at this from uh, a development angle. Uh, we are here mainly this week talking about development, but also from um, a technology angle, like our colleague from S3 has just very ably um, spoken about. So looking at this from three main pieces, one, sustainable regional economic integration, improved management of uh, risks like we saw previously, and East African institutions that provide leadership view. This is where disasters get really bad and out of hand. You have to bring in humanitarian agencies to focus on some of the, the relief efforts that uh, people are whether it is flooding, you show, I mean, you saw the pictures from the Sudan, people who have lost entire homes. And you can look at this and pinpoint a number of areas also on the continent where you know uh, relief agencies have worked uh, tirelessly to offer um, support in, in terms of humanitarian assistance. I don't want to mention the names, but you know them. Uh, next. So from from when you categorize the, the issues, you might uh, hear a lot of uh, mention in the next three days about shocks and stresses. Um, that simply means that when you have um, a disaster like drought and you had a farmer who had uh, five or ten head of cattle, and then that in a few days or in a month is reduced to nothing, is a shock in the livelihood of that particular individual or community that is impacting on the resilience capability of this particular person. And you can look at the numbers uh, in the region, 60% uh, six, of the te territory that is eager. The region is also currently bat battling issues like uh, death locusts, but you also have population growth 
which is driving some of these issues that we are talking about. And then all other issues like COVID, if you compound that, you have the kind of picture like uh, our colleague from S3 was trying to, to build. Next. So um, this is an interesting picture in terms of uh, where population is really putting strain on resources that are available on the continent. We know that all of us are in a way competing for resources. That's why we, we learned about Darwin's uh, theory back in high school. But it, if you look at the picture on the, on the right and the red around the Lake Victoria region, you will see that in coming years for a number of uh, reasons. One is that's a region that's also very well endowed in terms of resources, but the population pressure around there, whether it is farmlands or agriculture or, uh, or livestock, is, is immense. So in terms of resilience planning, these are areas that you'd really want to focus your attention and resources in future to make sure that communities um, remain resilient and the, the gains that have been made in terms of their livelihoods are not eroded by the shocks that we are talking about. Next. The youth. They have been mentioned, uh, I don't want to say by a raise of hand, how many are below 35. We don't want to go there, but this is another tsunami that uh, by being able to compute a country's resilience capacity, I think USAID does a lot of this to try and visualize in a simple way what is a country's capacity or a resilience capacity and how best is a country able to move forward without the gains that they have made uh, in national resilience uh, getting eroded. You can see some of the countries in the region that are considered to have fairly low capacity uh, in, in resilience for a number of issues. Um, next. So if you are to really define resilience in a very simple way, you've got to look at the shocks and the stresses, the resilience capacities, and the well-being and the outcomes of the people that you are, you are putting this uh, into. So simply as the ability to manage adversity and change without compromi compromising uh, future well-being. Next, Teddy. So again, I think we looked at the ability and then the, the strategies to mitigate and adapt and be able to recover from these shocks and stresses. When you have a flood that has wiped out a community's uh, homes and agricultural farms, just how long does it take for you to be able to get that community back on track and to be able to do effectively what they used to do and support their, their lives? That is key. And from a mapping perspective, that can also be put into context so that when you're planning for settlements and you know that area X has persistently had flooding and area X is also subject to uh, looking at climatic patterns going to become more and more flooded, then you really got to rethink uh, the future of that community uh, residing in that, in that area. Next. So you can look at resilience uh, in terms of uh, livelihoods the systems that we are talking about here in terms of social systems, and then the people. If these technologies that we are talking about here don't talk about people, then I think we, we have failed a great deal. So let's think about what people element is in every other proposal and discussion that we will have in, in this uh, forum this, this particular uh, week. Next, study. So I will, I will not go into this in detail, but again, the picture is very live in our minds. Areas that have persistently required humanitarian aid, whether this is in terms of food aid or other types of aid in, in the region. And these are areas that um, call for us to rethink the way we build the resilience around uh, our peoples and communities. It is probably easy to think that because I don't live in one of the areas where the big uh, balloons are, new 
areas to settle. Nairobi is not what it used to be 10 years back. Then regional cooperation. I think our colleague just mentioned that we shouldn't lose the opportunity to really make sure that we cooperate. And instead of doing things in silos, we make sure that we add synergies. What you do and PASCO or ESRI can add value into it, then we need to think of that as, as a matter of building uh, regional cooperation. Then the capacity, I mean the region's capacity to address critical issues like health threats and uh, uh, conflicts that are from other issues. The barriers to trade and investments, some of the problems that we are talking about here could as well be very easily solved by trade and investments. If somebody feels that they can trade freely within the East African community, they have very little time to think about conflict within the region. So that becomes one way to think about also building resilience of, of our time. Then, of course, other issues about uh, counter-terrorism and uh, violent ex ex extremism. Next, Teddy. So I think we talked about the partnerships. We can skip this. Um, the way to really go about this um, uh, programmatically, region by region or element by element. Just go next. The emerging priority issues, we talked about that. Next. And then what is one of the agency's main focus at, at the moment? You, if you've worked with the agency, I think you've seen the paradigm shift towards also focusing more on issues to do with climate change and how climate change relates to all these other vulnerabilities that we are talking about. Next. So finally, look, looking at this from, uh, I think that the whole aim of this presentation was really to broaden our scope in terms of thinking that the technologies are great and they are important. But bring those technologies to a development context and make sure that you look at the development issues that your neighbor is going through and the region as a whole needs to sort out. Then that technology, earth observation, GIS, and um, everything else becomes incredibly important in addressing the issues that we are talking about. Um, I think you should be headed to the final one. Thank you, and if I messed up, please refer to Chihenyo. If you have questions, also make sure you ask Chihenyo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robis. Robinson. You have been a very good uh, substitute, and uh, I thank you. I would like to have another applause for the presenters, please. Yeah, as we applause, let's also look at the key things that we have uh, had to take from the session and that uh, from uh, Esri, uh, David mentioned uh, about power, power of spatial data and that uh, there are various applications available at global level but and that um, th th there has to be uh, a, a key eye on the resilience matrix that brings different uh, stakeholders to uh, tackle or to handle uh, these, these issues. And that uh, uh, amidst of that there is a key issue of population growth, uh, of course related to stress and that we are really looking at harnessing the dividend of the youth. Uh, we would not call them a problem, otherwise it is not uh, yeah, uh, 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 wise, since we are looking at the youth as a resource in the area of uh, tackling the issues of resilience. Uh, and the, the, the key issue of conflicts has also come, and it is also related to really uh, uh, security. Conflicts and security was highlighted and we should also go back with a message about capacity, not just deficiency, but also that the capacities that we have in the region that are growing ever and ever. And that uh, amidst of all that, I think what came out from the presentations were the people, 
that this conference brings at the far front the people uh, both in the technologies but also in the uh, uh, beneficiary uh, area of the technology. Thank you so much. Some politicians say 10% is, is too much. You wonder if they are exposed enough because a country like Finland has a forest cover of about 75%. Germany, 82 million people on an area that is almost half the size of Kenya. You don't see the towns overcrowded. Forest cover, 33%. Then we are complaining about 10%. Yes, GS can help us to monitor this and communicate effectively to policymakers. So there you can see some loops R and B. R is a reinforcing loop or a positive feedback loop. It means if you let that cycle continue, it can result in a vicious cycle. So agricultural land use extends and green parks, if you expand agricultural area uh, without control, you'll be consuming the green parks. Then it becomes a vicious cycle. That is what we call a positive feedback loop or enforcing loop. But a balancing loop is one that controls itself, like negative feedback loop. Like your body temperature. You are not a poly kilogram, you are a what? So biologists can tell us, your body can regulate the temperature. So that balancing loop, you can see, if you have green areas, agriculture, and extractive land use, it cannot continue unabated. So the more you bring more factors into the equation, and use GS technology to map the areas, and even water use per capita and water demand modeling, you can come up with a very clear picture of where we want to go and the policies that you must undertake. So, moving from the complex to the simple, and that is what differentiates people with true mastery from people who are just doing academics for the sake of it, okay? If you cannot simplify the complex to communicate in a simple manner to policymakers, then we'll remain with these many papers, yet we want to impact the policymaking space. So we have simplified this one with our main T, Wilson Kibe, in a way that anyone can understand it. For example, mm -hmm. our governor, the new governor of Nairobi can now understand this one very well. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> because if you give the governor this one, what, what will you discuss really? <laughs> 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 Being personal, I'm just talking with any governor of any city because they want something that is quick and implementable. So let's move from that simple complex to the simple. So what we did with Wilson here is to ask ourselves, how can you put this one in a matrix? Four quadrants. The aspirational goal is to have uh, this green, smart, green, and sustainable city. What are some of the characteristics of that? I guess you studied in Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. did not study in Delhi. I just wondered where it's an ecological data. Yeah. It, it's uh, a very efficient city as far as I'm concerned. But it's okay. Yeah, we, we, can, we can discuss that. And again, uh, we'll rearrange this one so that we can have one to one matching from left to right. For example, when we talk of integrated planning, what is it in terms of smart ecological data in terms of planning? We do that with Wilson. And Wilson will take some questions if I'm asked any questions so that they can know you are a true mentee. <laughs> so, conclusion. <laughs> conclusion, we need to move from linear or reductionist approach to a systems approach. A city is a social organism. It is not a toolbox. It is, it is a system. You know, in a toolbox, you remove one item. That, that doesn't mean it is no longer a toolbox. It is still a toolbox. But from your body, you injure part of your nail, and the whole body will be feeling the pain, OK? If the doctor tells you that, that is just 10% or 1% of your body, you are well, you'll be very annoyed with that doctor, because your body is a system. It is not a toolbox. We need stakeholder participation and participatory GS and citizen science. And what a green area policy for cities? Are we saying for a parcel of land, 30% must be green area for ecosystem services? A city that you can live, work, and play in, not only live and work. We also need the recreational component. Then those geospatial metrics are recommended. Let's have, for example, for Nairobi, what is the ratio of parks or green areas to paved areas? Because that will also give an indicator on how you can avoid 
uh, these urban heat islands. Non-motorized non transport versus motorized transport space, pedestrian walkways and cyclist paths, travel times, special proximity to emergency response centers, flow area ratios and ground coverage ratios. And such a space station support model or system will be resourceful to researchers, city planners and governments. These are now the users. And that is the end of our, my presentation. Uh, thank you. We are ready for questions. My question goes to this presentation and the other presentation of this sponge. Yeah, this sponge. So all this, all this are in sustainable development, with sustainable cities. Uh, city. But then, when we talk about sponge city, like that was the case for Nakuru. Is it fi fi uh, then to, uh, to the plan I have a question. Has this been implemented? And if not, why? why what are the reasons why, why, why it is not implemented? Then to this, to this one, to defending Nairobi that at least we are doing something. Uh, <laughs> that is true. It has been said that uh, the last stroke that breaks the camel's back is not necessarily the strongest, eh? but it's a cumulative effect. Eh? Maybe you you retire at 99, but the 100 stroke would break the back, or the water would cut through the rock by through that persistence. So I believe in Nairobi, though we are um, classifying it under not smart ecological data, with what we have done, we have even seen what we have done in the transport sector, infrastructure development, we are almost in the boundary, and we are we can readily slip into smart ecological data. So it is just a matter of time, but we need to do more. Then uh, you are also asking uh, about devolution. I, in fact, when you are asking the question, I wrote down the answer as devolution. Devolution as a key promise. Because that is historically what has made a country like Germany, uh, where it is based on its history and the way of owning land, land tenure, it was easy to decentralize. So that you find uh, all the cities are almost, they have good quality schools, you don't have to go to a university in Berlin. But here, I think, I think there's more prestige if you are from the University of Nairobi than from Tamboya University, where I come from in Omabe. So can we equalize? So if you ask me, uh, we need to apply deliberate economics. For example, there's this economist called Ricardo, who talked about comparative advantages. So can we map out our country and see what is more viable where? For example, Northeastern. What should it specialize in? And what should the governor prioritize so that Turkana County, for example, can be very effective in exporting some products to some parts of Kenya. People there can also be skilled in a way that they can make maximum use of the indigenous environments. So that is key. The evolution can uh, solve that, but we need a deliberate approach. And I also challenge you to be a governor of your county because you are the people who are tired of this stagnation. So when you are governor, work with the lecturers, researchers. You know, some people, once they become governors, they think knowledge workers should be free, should be volunteers. That is the mentality that is killing us in Africa. When you hear someone is a professor, he has a PhD, you ask him, what will you, uh, will I pay you to do this work? No, I can't pay you all that. But then you find someone else, you are ready to pay millions because of, uh, a distorted world view, yet knowledge is very hard to cultivate over time so that you can be uh, an expert solving problems. And uh, then uh, I also talk of the priority. If that be the priority, I would say it is in space. 
For example, if you want to implement what we call land banking in Nairobi, you really have problems because we have subdivided that land, very many small pieces of land, private title holders. They want you, if you want to develop infrastructure across a given area, you have to compensate people in billions because land reform has not been effective, but you find there are countries where you have big chunks of land that can be used for land banking so that infrastructure, public infrastructure provision can be easier. So let's have a, a conversation about land reform and land consolidation. Then we'll have economies of scale when we are planning. And there are good examples which you can refer to, for example, Korea had a very effective uh, land control, what we call green belts. Uh, the state of Oregon in the United States, urban growth boundaries, very effective and it's a best practice. And in other countries, we have urban service boundaries. So instead of being very strict, you can just limit services. And you say beyond this radius from Nairobi, you won't be supplying. The city council will not be providing water services. So that becomes a factor discouraging development about that area, and you can have it as a green area. And finally, should uh, a smart city be competitive? Of course, if we go with what Ricardo is saying here, and if we go with technological revolution or technological innovation, then I can say it should be competitive. And this competitiveness with technological innovation should help us reduce the cost of offering unit service. And COVID also showed us that you can work from home and we have a term for it now, it's called remotopia. Remotopia means you work remotely. So these graduates can work from Homer Bay, and then you pay them just from Homer Bay where they are, and they help develop the infrastructure in Homer Bay. But through that NAVA system of GIS, ICT, and quality control with men mentors available, we can have a well-networked uh, development trajectory for our countries, and we become competitive but cities are centers of growth, as you have seen, so we should be competitive. Thank you. You know, we need goodwill. I always call it uh, political goodwill, not just political will. There must be goodwill. And then researchers also have to be more visible. I know there are researchers here who are uh, almost uh, allergic to social media. Then you wonder how will people know what you are doing? And are you really digesting, distilling the message in a way that policymakers can uh, up, take it up. Uh, I'm a beneficiary of social media, for example. There is one time I was just tweeting in the year 2019, and then I got a DM. That is direct message. <laughs> <laughs> From Australia. So this Australian secretary to the Australia Pacific Training Coalition just wrote to me that you are very active in the area of youth mentorship and skills development. You are talking of drops of skills in an ocean of academic qualifications in Africa. But we have a summit for Asia Pacific and we need a representative from Africa. Can you come? Then after three days, I said, no, because you also have to show them that you are busy. If you just say that. <laughs> <laughs> it means in economics, you are because economic survives on scarcity. <laughs> So after that, they funded my going to Fiji from Germany, and it was a very good trip. And that was part of very good networking. And I have friends from there I network with for research. And then this uh, quadrant I'm showing here, we are going to implement it in Zambia uh, very soon, a village called Nangweshi in Zambia. They want to start from scratch, the way you are saying, for a smart and green city. So we need that political goodwill, and the researchers are challenged to be more visible. Don't be in your isolated cocoons, just speaking among yourselves. That is inbreeding, but we need cross fertilization. <laughs> so that's the challenge I will give them. Why are we coping from these other cities? Old cities have been young, but young cities have not been old. So young cities have something to learn from the old. So we don't need to reinvent the wheels, but I agree that we also need to have our local realities and local aspirations. That is where we need a mix. And when you are doing benchmarking, you have to benchmark against the best. So uh, the challenge is to reduce, we, we should not copy wholesale, but we should domesticate 
and also <coughs> within local stakeholder participation. But we cannot completely do away with uh, the good examples from best practices. And these best practices also include tough lessons that they are telling you, don't repeat it. Like your father will tell you, I did this when I was young, please don't repeat it. And we say wise people are able to learn from the mistakes of other people. Thank you for that. And, uh... and then on land surface temperature, I'm just also curious to understand uh, what are some of the solutions that we are exploring towards uh, making sure that we keep the LNC at a minimum. Thank you. I'm sure he will summarize by that point. Next, there was someone to understand uh, the implications of growth on the thermal environment. Of course, we know there are several other factors that can cause uh, warming besides uh, land use change, but uh, we also know that uh, it also has an influence. So this is uh, the city of uh, Blawayo, which we call uh, the city of kings and queens uh, in Zimbabwe. So right away, I will move uh, to the results which we uh, observed, we looked at uh, the trends from 1990 up until uh, 2030 in the city. Uh, if you look uh, closely, you'd see that uh, the red and brownish areas are expanding. Uh, we're expanding. Uh, of it is the uh, the standard for climate studies, uh, and then uh, in this case, we made local climate zones as I indicated earlier. At the same time, we also looked at what was happening uh, to the surface temperatures in response. Uh, uh, there was warming which was happening uh, in, the, uh, in the city. So visual inspection shows that uh, in 2020, the areas uh, which, which, which were recording uh, late surface temperatures above 46 degrees, it actually uh, expanded in the city. So if you compare to, uh, uh, to 1990, you'll actually see uh, the great differences. And then we also tried to understand uh, what a transition can do to, uh, to, to the surface temperatures of an area. For example, the meaning of uh, transitioning an area from compact low rise to open low rise, that is a place that is uh, high rise buildings which are compact, the implications on temperature. So, uh, such that, for example, we could notice that in Harare, in, in Blawayo, if that happens... Uh, Excuse, let me just interrupt you a bit. There is just that alarm. <laughs> it's just really some more. Let me just confirm that maybe we need to go over. Maybe there is an emergency. Let me just leave, leave the room. Huh? Sorry. <laughs> This uh, week I'll be talking about uh, the trends in the local climate zones and uh, then also to look at uh, what is happening to uh, extreme events uh, in a growing city which is uh, Bulawayo in, uh, in Zimbabwe. So basically the idea is that as we grow, we want uh, to, to grow uh, sustainably and then another measure, in our case, uh, because I'm a climate scientist, I don't know those other measures that we've been talked about but I know uh, the climate perspective, so I would expect that our growth should also be uh, climate, sm climate smart. Okay, so we are aware that our cities are growing, uh, both in numbers, and then there's a lot of uh, conversion that is happening uh, in terms of uh, changing the, uh, the, uh, the surfaces, uh, the materials in the city uh, from primary production, and then we have uh, buildings in place. In some places, they are congested, uh, resulting in effect on uh, surface as well as uh, air, uh, air temperatures. So that is uh, what we want to measure. And then there's what we can measure with remote sensing. Uh, we do have an advantage of spatial analysis, but uh, at the same time, uh, there are also other limitations. Uh, for example, currently in terms of uh, temporal resolution. Then also sometimes, even as we use remote sensing, uh, we are also aware that uh, urban areas are complex. Like, for example, uh, in a 30 by 30 meter area, uh, there are so many changes that can happen uh, within that area. Or similarly so, a single building can also have uh, varying effects. On one side, it can be absorbing, and then on the other side, it can also be uh, causing some shading. So basically, this is what uh, we did. Uh, we mapped 
local climate uh, zones. Uh, local climate zones are standardized, uh, three-dimensional. Uh, should I call them uh, land use land cover classes? But however, these ones are related uh, to, to climate and then they are local in nature. Then the advantage is that they are standardized. So sometimes we can say rural, but the meaning of rural is different from one part of the world uh, to another. So adoption of uh, local climate zones becomes uh, very much ideal. And then at the same time, we also used uh, uh, what we call uh, extreme climate indices. In this case, we just focus on those that speak uh, to temperature, the ones that we derived by Climdex. I'll show you uh, the list. It's also a standardized list uh, that is uh, accepted uh, globally.